So uh, I thank you very much for coming out for our Votorama. If you brought your ballots, that's great. We'll walk through them later if you like. Um, we have two great speakers on three very important measures that are gonna be on our ballot in November. So I am so excited that we have um, Lucy Messing and uh, Tom Chabin here to talk with us today. So I will, I'm going to describe Tom first because he'll be our first speaker today and then I'll, I'll introduce Lucy and we'll just pass the microphone back and forth. So Tom is a resident of Arizona for 25 years. He hails from Kansas, but we're not gonna hold that against him. <laughs> he is, um, he lived for 25 years in the Navajo and Hopi communities and he was first elected to the school board in Tuba City. He was on the County Board of Supervisors in Coconino County, did I say that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, he was at Arizona State Representative District, uh, which includes Flagstaff and Native American tribal communities. He ran for Arizona Corporate Commission in 2016. This is the heartbreaking one where uh, Tom lost by uh, less than three points and it was after the Arizona Corporate Commission, um, not, or, uh, it was APS, Arizona um, Public, Service. Public Services, thank you. I've been canvassing all day, my brain is dehydrated. Um, they spent $4 million to defeat him in that race, and so we're, he's gonna talk about clean energy first, and then at the end of our, um, our trio, he's going to talk about the dirty money issue, which is really important. And Lucy Messing is a former teacher in TUSD. She taught for 31 years. She has served as the president of the Tucson Educators Association. She is now a on the register, or, sorry, retired educators association. She is also the chair of the Democratic Education Caucus. Lucy is a big fighter for education, and we're really excited to have her here today to talk about Red for Ed, Invest in Ed measure. So, without further talking to me, the dehydrated one, um, <laughs> here's Tom Chabin. Now I'm putting my timer on for 15 minutes. <laughs> and, and then we'll do a close, and then uh, so I understood that, that that's about how long I have. I put this in front of all of you. Heck of a deal. So this is clean energy for a healthy Arizona is, is the, the, uh, oh good lord. There we go. Doesn't do any good unless you start the clock, right? <laughs> I could keep on going and tell you I'm still within 15 minutes. <laughs> but th this is an initiative to create a standard in Arizona where our utilities <clears throat> will be required to use renewable energy sources at, at the level of 50% by 2030. Right now, right now, it's less than 10%. And right now, the standard established by the Arizona Corporation Commission in about 2004, 2005, when then commissioner, then Republican commissioner, now Democrat, running for the Arizona Commission, uh, Bill Mandel, uh, established a standard that th we shall be 15% renewable by 2026. So this trumps that standard. Trumps. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that, that, that cuss word just slipped out. So, so, so this negates that old standard and accelerates it. What does it mean if we realize this? For one thing, we will be breathing cleaner, cleaner air. Today, Carbon-producing plants in coal and natural gas contribute to carbon that grades our ozone that affects global warming, period. That is happening, and this, employing this new standard, simply means we'll, we'll produce less carbon 
even as the state grows in population, given that the standard will be 50%, there shall be less carbon produced. That will help with respect to people who suffer from asthma. It will mitigate our global warming, which we feel the effects today, don't we? And what about the awful storms that we've seen in Arizona? I mean, I have lived in Arizona over 40 years, 45 years, and I had never seen a haboob no. yeah. right. yes. yeah. until about the last three or four years. Yes. The intensity of the storms has all has to deal with the effect of global warming. Now, there's two other compelling arguments beyond saving our earth and beyond living healthier that I want you to pay close attention. The first is that if we establish these standards, the utilities of Arizona will be compelled to use their customers as a partner for residential solar. Second aspect, and if that happens, the cost of your electricity will go down. Now, I am yelling at this, <laughs> simply because our utilities are attempting to say two things. It's funny, they can't seem to get their act together, because in Phoenix, Arizona Public Service says, utility bill will go up by $1,500 a year. That's not true. <laughs> Our Tucson Electric and Power says your bill will go up $400 a year. Now, given the makeup of our corrupted corporation commission, what they predict may very well be true. But if we have a corporation commission that is concerned about us as customers, that is not true. And I'm going to explain one little bit, and that, that's about net metering. How many people here have solar? God bless you. And so because you've installed it, I remember this. I met you when I ran for the Corporation Commission. Uh, with net metering, it just simply is this. If they produce an, on a day like today, a long day, with lots of sunlight, an extra kilowatt hour, then they consume. TEP takes it and sells it to their next door neighbor that doesn't have a solar, sells it to the neighbor for the retail price of that kilowatt hour. Now at night, when the sun goes down and they need that back, net metering means they get it back, they get their kilowatt hours back. In the rate cases before the commission now, and then for any new solar customer, a new solar customer will have to pay for it. Now, if at the end of the year, they have pr produced more electricity and TEP has sold it, they'll get a check for a wholesale price of that, that, you, that uh, that, that energy that you produce, you get a little bit, right? No. You don't get anything. No. So, we either use it or lose it. Yeah, use it or lose it. Well, given the calendar, anyhow, we get, we're getting into the weeds. But the point of all this is, TEP took the excess energy he produced and sold it to a neighbor. Net metering means he gets what he gets what he gave, he gets back. The new rates before the commission simply says when he wants it back, if you're going to be a new solar customer, you got to pay for it. Now, why do the utilities do this? Why are they doing this? Because simply he lowered his bill. When he made the investment on his solar, on his home, he lowered his bill. Less revenue. TEP made from you last year $288 million.
from you. On average, about $450 per customer. From you. Arizona Public Service made over $2 billion at, at, over the last five years. We're going to tell the story of two great utilities in the state of Arizona. Great because of their service and their reliability. Salt River Project and Arizona Public Service. They both have $1.2 million, million customers. One is a municipality, no profit. No profit. APS made $488 million last year. Salt River Project, nothing. The CEO at APS made $15 million last year. The CEO at Salt River Project, $1.2 million. Poor guy. Poor guy. <laughs> Against this initiative, funded by Tom Steyer, APS has put on, on deposit $11 billion to, to go after Corporation Commission candidates, to elect their candidates, and to fight this initiative. $4 million. <coughs> they spent $4 million to examine the signatures of the in initiative. Yeah. When they found someone circulating this initiative on the street, they offered them $7,100 to quit and affirm $220,000 not to circulate the petitions. God's truth. God's truth. Now what they want to do and what TEP is doing is treating you not as a customer. You are a captured customer. You are paying a monopoly. The city here, the county here, issued a franchise, permissive by the voters, approved by the voters, that says TEP can sell electricity to you. You're a franchise. You're trapped. You can't go anywhere else. But they've forgotten that. And they don't want to treat you, they don't want to treat you like a customer. <coughs> the little elitist, the latest stroke by APS and TEP, I believe, is that they have formed a trade association. You know, really, they're underrepresented and, you know, I mean, they've got to establish some voice somewhere and created a trade association. And it's being headed by Bob Stump, former commissioner, of the, the guy that was lost his cell phone that the state paid that had messages between the dark money campaigns, APA. That guy is heading up the new trade association to present the case before the Arizona Corporation Commission that you as ratepayers should pay for closing down the coal fire plants. Now my question is, my question is, are you a customer or a shareholder? Shareholders should pay for that. And they're making plenty of money, $288 million, RTEP, to close down the plant. Even if it's a billion dollars, they can figure out how to pay that off in a 20-year note. But we shouldn't have to pay for it. One other note. You and I pay for their income taxes. TEP's income taxes. We pay for them. So when Justin Olson stands up and says, look, I helped lower your rates because of the, I'm not going to cuss again, but because of the <laughs> Trump cut to corporate taxes, mm -hmm. your bill's supposed to go down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are we doing paying for the income taxes for TEP? That's a shareholder's job. That's not our job. So what are, what are we talking about? 
we're talking about our future. I am glad to speak to a group like you because we can all reminisce and think back <laughs> I always point to the fact, do you remember your first computer, right? I remember, I was so proud of it, it was a Samuel dual disk drive, you know, WordStar, CalStar, 64K. <laughs> but can we see what our future is going to be in five years, 10 years, 2030? Can we think about that, 2030? Can't we imagine that when you buy a house, in fact, there's a subdivision now going in around the Prescott Valley where every home is being installed with solar? Yeah. Every home? We're gonna have solar on our roofs and a Tesla battery in our garage, just like we have an air conditioner in our homes today. That, that's gonna happen, that's our destiny. I think of our, I, I think of the technology of then, my 64K, or my Sanyo computer that I bought 30 or 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I guess, and I realize that it's not as powerful as the computer in my hand. Yeah, right. <laughs> Where are we going to be? This is our destiny. Renewable energy, clean air, that is our destiny. And the utilities are only standing in the, in the way to obstruct that destiny. I'm asking for two things. One, I'll send, send around a sheet. If you're halfway interested in, ha in volunteering for us, please sign up. It's a very worthy cause. The second thing, we need to have endorsements. So I'm gonna send that around a sheet that you can individually sign as, to endorse this. And we're also looking for small business owners. If you know of any, if you can approach me afterwards and share any names, I would appreciate it. So with that, this is my first speech, by the way, on this one. So uh, thank you very much. Forty-five seconds left. Oh, you did good. <laughs> I guess I better time myself too, but if anybody has ever heard Tom, he can actually go on and on. <laughs> he has no problem. He does have good information though, so I'll set mine because I think I have that same problem. Um, as Laura said, I am the chair of the Democratic Education Caucus, but prior to that, as a teacher in the Tucson Unified School District, I saw the changes from when I first started teaching in 1972 until I left the, the classroom. We have had tax cuts since 1990, every year except for one, and that was in 2003. And the tax cuts were always given as a trickle down, right? We're all gonna do better because there's gonna be more money up here trickling down. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't felt that trickle. And our schools suffered for it. Unfortunately, they took such incredible amounts of money out of our schools that buildings were starting to fall apart, classrooms were erupting with children, um, they didn't have enough books, supplies, and so now you hear about where we go on these um, asking for school supplies because teachers are paying for them because there is no money to pay for them from the school. The school has to decide how to spend their money and now they've also reached out to parents. How many of you as grandparents see the list that they, they get to, to buy school supplies for the teachers? So that's kind of how we got into this situation where school budgets were being cut and teachers were leaving the state at an alarming rate. In TUSD alone, which is, a, is the second largest district in the state, they had 100 empty classrooms from teachers. So they had long-term subs. They had subs who actually would just rotate in who weren't even consistent. 
What kind of quality education were we offering in that case? Throughout the state, there were actually about 8,000 empty classrooms. We should be shocked and we should try to address that. Meanwhile, teachers just sort of plugged along. Teachers do their job. They love their students, they love their schools, they love what they do. But it was getting worse. And enough was enough. And so therefore you saw the Red for Ed movement. And I have to tell you, as an active teacher in political action, trying to get other teachers motivated, trying to get other teachers to walk, to talk, to go with me up to the Capitol, to do all those things. And, and so many were, I don't want to get involved. I don't like politics. I just want to teach. I don't blame them. I just wanted to teach too. But every decision that was being made that harmed schools was a political one. We had no choice but to get involved. And I don't know exactly if it was the motivation to see the other states that walked, but when almost 75,000 teachers walked to the Capitol on that day, that was it. And it, it, it sort of lit this movement that carried over into the Invest in Ed Act. And there was quite a discussion about the Invest in Ed Act and if we should move forward with that because could we collect enough signatures in that short amount of time, May 2nd, I believe it was launched, May 2nd, and, and you had to have 150,000 valid signatures by um, July 5th. Well, teachers were motivated. They felt like if we could do, if we could move the governor to, for, from a 1%, which he kept saying, 1% he was going to give teachers as a raise. If we could move the governor to a 9%, well, maybe we can do something else. And so they got to work. And they turned in, along with the help of many others, 270,000 signatures. And they have been coming in at a high validation rate. And so, we're, we're pretty sure that it's going to be on the ballot. It's going to the counties now. And we've already seen what's happened with the uh, people coming out against it. Of course, the chambers, you know. Um, and here's the part I guess I find very interesting. Who has benefited the most from all these tax cuts over the years? Not me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the people who have the money, because they're supposed to trickle it down. <laughs> but we know that isn't happening. So as an example of, of, of what they did was they went out and they did polling. Our working poor, they pay about $12 per $100 in taxes. Those people who make $400,000, they pay $5. Wow. So I'm kind of thinking, it won't hurt them to go up a few bucks. And that's what, they're, that's what we're asking. That is what the Invest in Ed is. It's to have a fair share campaign. Let's all just pay an, an equitable amount to educate the future of Arizona. Children should not suffer because the people in power want to give more tax breaks and tax cuts to their friends. Because, like I say, I don't know anybody who has benefited from all the tax cuts. 74% of corporations in this state, 74% only pay $50 in taxes. There's something wrong with that. And the truth is, we have a, a law, a, it's in our Constitution, that children are supposed to be educated. And they should have the tools. Teachers should be paid a fair amount. 
We are one of the lowest states that pay our teachers. That's why they're leaving to California, to Nevada, to Colorado, to New Mexico, to Utah. They all pay more than we do. And they're right next door. There was a campaign from Nevada that actually went to teachers' um, conferences and gave out flyers to give them a $15,000 raise if they went to Nevada. I had a friend who did that. He made a bunch of money and came back because he really liked Tucson better. But he left for I think about five years. Anyway, so in order to fix that, we're not asking anybody to take their shirt off their back. We're just asking for a little bit of equity. And that's what it is, it's equity. When schools now, in terms of students, receive a little over $1,000 less than they did in 2008. So we're going down instead of keeping up with inflation. And I know that some of you, um, you're familiar with Prop 123. That wasn't necessarily the way to go. But that only put back 18% of the money that was taken away. They were still a billion dollars short. So, you know, I, 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 it's done. It's here. I don't like the fact they're taking money from the state trust lands. I don't. So this will also help with that. If we can put more money into the schools, then we'll be able to fund the resources, the salaries, and the buildings to give kids the best shot that they deserve. A quality education, you can't take away what a quality education will do for our kids. The benefits, not just to them, but it's an investment in our future as well. Because we want those kids to be educated, to be able to start businesses, to be able to be doctors, to be able to do the things that we hope will continue and be there for us. We need them paying taxes. That's what our social security is. So an investment in education is an investment in, in our economy. It truly is. That has been proven. If we can make sure that kids can get jobs and be productive citizens, that, is, that, is, that should be our goal. So the Invested Ed Act, um, in order to address that, basically will go from a 4% right now on those individuals um, earning $250,000 or more to 8%. Those individuals, $500,000 to a million dollars, it'll go from um, 6% to 9%. I think they can probably handle that. It's really not. They, they tried to throw some language in there. I don't know if any of you kept up with what the uh, legislature was doing, uh, specifically um, Speaker Mesnard. They were trying to put language for the ballot initiative to just blow it completely out of proportion, like we were going to gouge the rich, you know? Uh, the judge threw it out and said it was not accurate and therefore they had to rewrite it. I don't know exactly what it says now, but they didn't get away with it. They have been getting away with a lot as far as taking money from education, taking money from child services, taking money from health care, and, and, and it's, it's, it's our time. It's our time to make that stop. If we all get out and vote for the Invest in Ed Act, we will put money back in our schools. We will keep teachers here in Arizona. Oh, is that my time? <laughs> and, then, and then we will all benefit. So I thank you for this time, and I'll be happy to answer questions after.
So I'm back. <laughs> and better than ever. All right. Let's remember that this is going to be an extraordinary year, 2016, on our ballot, because here we have the initiative inspired by teachers with the passion. <laughs> 2018. Yeah. God, I'm getting great. <laughs> we wish it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, we'll do do over. But but here with the the this initiative, uh, we can invest in education. In 305, the teachers again put that on the ballot. We can get rid of the stupid voucher thing for education, right? We can vote no on that. We can clean up our energy, lower our electric bills, force the monopolies to be compliant with the, the will of the Arizona voters. And then the fourth one, we can make the Koch brothers and Arizona Public Service come out of the darkness of dirty money and report what they are contributing. Terry Goddard, formerly our Attorney General, candidate for Governor and Secretary of State. His father, I remember, was former Governor. A good guy. Terry Goddard is a prince stood up and said, look, let's do this initiative to make transparent every contribution made to any campaign, any in independent expenditure, so at least as voters, we know who's paying for the ads. Now, why was this necessary? The dark money that elected Doug Ducey, for one, the dark money, $3.2 million spent against Sandra Kennedy, that kept her from being on the Corporation Commission when she ran for re-election, funded by APS. Yeah. When then Commissioner Pierce, Gary Pierce, met with the CEO of APS during the rate hearing process, which is unforgivable, Commissioner should never meet with an applicant in a case before the commission. It's a quasi-judicial institution. You don't meet with the applicants. He did Phoenix Country Club. And his son, Justin, was running for Secretary of State. <laughs> and in dark money, $700,000 appeared in his race for the primary. Mark Brnovich. Attorney General also was funded with dark money. All unreported, all sourced by APS. I'm going to give you one other. APS gave $180,000 to the Arizona State University Alumni Association, which in turn gave $100,000 to a dark money group that played in the Corporation Commission race. Mm -hmm. Now, we should know about that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. All of that has been hidden, and it only took investigative reporters to dig it up and find it. Today, we are like this on this process, because the Arizona State Ch Chamber of Commerce not only challenging the, the ed for, or the invest in ed petitions, uh, APS challenging ours, and APS funded Arizona Chamber of Commerce is challenging the clean, the clean uh, money, or uh, if you will, the dirty, dirty money initiative uh, to reveal that. And we're like this. So it looks like there are enough valid signatures 
and the county recorders are going through the process to determine that. And it just could be down to maybe about a thousand signatures. Mm -hmm. It could be just that close. Mm -hmm. now, all of you signed it, didn't you? Did you sign yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Did you pass it? Yeah. Yeah. And your validity rate was very, very high. But if there was a T crossed, and you know what the legislature did, right? Right. And said, you know, you have to be strict compliant. Well, thank goodness the judges are not throwing out as many as APS and the chamber and everybody else wants. In our case, um, on the clean energy thing, 470,000 signatures. And APS says 400,000 are no good. <laughs> now we should come up with a good, good number, but the judge has allowed APS to take this to trial. So, so how do we clean this up, right? Well, let's vote, right? Let's let's take care of the legislature. Let's clean up the governor thing. Let's clean up the Corporation Commission, but by all means, with these initiatives generated by the signatures of citizens of Arizona, the dirty money thing, that is 70% approved by the Republicans in polling. The Ed for Invest in Ed is polling, yes. Our thing, our thing is 66% yes, but it's the billion dollars coming at us to try to tell us that no, you know, we, we don't think that way. Well, I don't think it makes any difference how much money they spend. I think we're going to win, and I think you're going to win, and I think we're going to win on all these propositions, and I think maybe Arizonans are kind of fed up, and we're going to just have a little change in leadership throughout the state. So, I think I could have spoke more, but there's no sense in doing it. You guys understand it. This is where we are. Let's keep our fingers crossed, and please support us. Thank you very much. Thank you.